Uh, this is my first time in the institute here. I haven't yet looked around because I, my flight landed like this morning. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I will, yeah, I know it's been a long afternoon, so, but I, so I have slides. I'll try to keep it interactive. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, I, will, I will speak slowly in case uh, my accent is difficult to understand, but feel free to interrupt me and repeat, ask me to repeat anything, right? So what this uh, tutorial is about, so, I'll, so overall in the next few days, I'm going to talk about multi-arm bandit techniques, mostly from theoretical perspective, and how those techniques have been used in reinforcement learning to learn uh, sequential decision-making problems where there are, uh, band, uh, there are uh, Markov decision processes involved, states involved, and so on. So we'll, we'll do a lot of stuff, but today, I'm just going to start with the basic multi-arm bandit problem and some algorithmic techniques, some proof techniques associated with them. And then slowly over the next few days, we'll build over that and extend them to reinforcement learning and interesting problems in operation. So what is the general problem about? So I like to say that this is really about learning from sequential interactions, and this is how I differentiated from the usual machine learning. So the idea here is that you want to learn while you're making decisions from the feedback that you get from the decision. And this pre presents a different kinds of challenges in terms of what decisions you should make also impact what you learn. So for example, think about a very common applications like online retail. And this is like, a, it's a snapshot from Amazon, but it could be anything similar, any similar online retail website, where, where the retailer is presenting you with some product options out of their huge catalog that you can look at. Now they have to make a decision every time a customer comes in and wants to find something, they have to make a decision about which of their millions of products to show to their customer. And they want to do it in a way that the customer actually likes what they are being shown and more likely to buy one of those. Now, they don't know a priori anything about a new customer or a customer ha who has only been a few times on the web. So how do they learn about uh, what the customer likes and what the customer doesn't like, what their preferences are, what kind of colors they like, what kind of price point they like, and so on? They learn it from the feedback that the customer provides by browsing on their So for example, the first time they show, you, they show the customer a display of products, maybe the customer doesn't like it. Out of those. That is not a useless activity. They still learn that the customer doesn't like these kind of things. Then they might show them something else and use this feedback to improve what they can show in the So this presents a setting of learning from sequential interaction. And here, the, one of the main uh, considerations I want to point out is this trade-off between learning and optimization. So here, when you're making a decision about which product to show, that's your decision, there, is, there are two objectives of that display. One is you want immediately the customer, if, if the customer immediately purchases something from that display, that's, that's a great outcome because you got some revenue, some reward decision. But there is, a, there is another purpose, which is to learn about the customer preference. So maybe you, you made a product display that is likely to attract customers, but it is the same display that you have been showing the customer for last 10 times. Then you don't learn anything about their preferences, what else they could have liked in future. So this, these two objectives of, these two outcomes of your decision, which is information and the immediate reward, they may not always be aligned with Because something that seems like will get customers' attention immediately may not provide new information about their preferences to you for having better decision in future. And more generally, we will see that you don't just want to learn about the customer's preferences from their inputs about just about that customer preferences. You may also want to use this customer's activity to learn about other similar. So that information is also very useful to you, which may be in conflict with the immediate report from this. So multi-arm bandit problem, and more general we'll see later on reinforcement learning problem, always deals with this trade-off between how to prioritize information versus, versus immediate, how to, how to balance between learning and optimization, learning from the data that gives or that user gives, 
versus optimizing your decisions. Or what we call technically, and we, I'll explain this term, is exploration versus whether to use your decision to explore the space of outcomes or to just exploit your learning so far and make the, and optimize the image. And this appears in a lot of different uh, applications where such sequential interactions are observed, where customers or the users are providing you online feedback from the decision. So let's get to the formal definition of the problem that we will look at to capture these trade-offs and decision-making. So the, the basic problem that we look at, uh, the name comes from this casino setting, the multi arm bandit name comes from a casino example. Imagine that you walk into a casino with, where there are 10 different machines that you can put your money on. And you, a priori, you don't know anything about these machines, like how each, each of these machines are rigged in the, with different probability of winning, but you don't know which machine is the best. And all you can do is, in order to learn which machine is best, is put a dollar in whichever machine you want to play on, see what happens. And based on what happened, you can learn something about the machine, and you can choose to put another doll in the same machine or choose another machine next. So you have $100, and you can decide how to spend these $100 to maximize your return. So if you knew a priori that, let's say, machine number five is the one with the highest probability of producing the jackpot, you, then the optimal, in, in, at least in terms of expectation, the optimal action would be just to put all your money in that machine. So play that machine 100 times and get the highest expected reward. But you don't know that. So there is no way to directly figure out which one it is. So you might want to then say, OK, let's try each of them and see what happens. And then we will use that data to decide which machine I want to put. So let's say you use $50 to try each machine five times. Then you collected that data, use your machine learning jobs, like find out which is the best best prediction of each of the uh, probability of winning, and then put your, all your rest of the $50 in the best predicted. Okay, that's what we call learning and then optimal. So first learn and then optimal. Use $50 to learn, $50 to optimal. But then who is to say what's the best amount of money to put in it? Maybe you can write the formulas and figure out how much samples to use and then how much to invest. But you can do something more, in, more uh, advanced. You, you don't have to first learn and then optimize. You can actually do this adaptively. So for example, you could put $5 in each of them and then figure out, OK, these three machines, they have no, they, they are used like they have really, really low probability. So I don't want to learn anything more about them. Then let's zoom in on these six machines, then put some more money on these six then find out the best three machines out of these six and put more money on them. So you can do this adaptively, spend your money adaptively to zoom in on the best machine over time. So, so it seems like there is a lot of different strategies you could use to decide how to divide your money between learning, exploration, and between actually earning or exploitation. It doesn't have to be a static way or one after another. The multi arm bandit problem is really about what is the best strategy to allocate this opportunity. So this money or the number of trials that you have, the time you have, whatever the, how many ever times you can make these decisions, how to allocate that into learning. And your goal is just to overall maximize your. Any questions? Just uh, in, feel free to interrupt. So let's give the formal definition first. And this is the definition we will be dealing with for a, for a large part of the lecture until we basically remove every single assumption. So here, we will assume, first of all, that um, so here's some important part of the assumption. So you're making online decision, which means that at every time step t, you're going in sequential rounds. These are discrete rounds, t equals 1, 2, 3, t, a capital T. In every round, you need to pull one out of n possible, what we call arms from the multi arm bandit terminology. You can think about n action. You need to take one action, so it's sequential in the sense that at every time you know everything observed from the past t minus. 
and you can use that information however you want to decide your TSP. And every time you pull the arm, and this is one of the key assumptions that we will rely on when designing our algorithm, is that every time you pull an arm, a fixed arm, irrespective of how you selected that arm and what arms you pulled before, every time you pull an arm, the reward will be generated from the same, same distribution specific to that arm, uh, IID from the other. So this, there is a fixed distribution that you don't know about. Every time you pull that arm, the reward is generated from that same distribution, and the distribution's mean is what expected value is what we call mu i. The reward expected value for the arm is mu i. <clears throat> the other important assumption, and this is even when we relaxed, when we will relax a lot of these uh, earlier assumptions, this is something that we will, this is something uh, which, is, which is a key defining property of this set of problems is some kind of censoring in the field. So what does that mean? So you imagine that casino example, one of the main things, assumptions that I was making is that when you pull the arm of one machine, when you play, put your dollar in one machine, you don't learn anything about the other. So the only way to learn about a machine is to actually invest money in it and lose some money. So there is a cost to learning because you don't learn about a machine unless you put, unless you try it. The only way you can learn about a decision is by And this is what we call bandit feedback and some kind of censoring or feedback that only the reward of the pulled arm can be of. Later on, we will relax it a little bit in the sense that maybe you can learn a little bit about close by arms and things like that, but this will be something central to the problem. So given this setup, our goal is uh, to decide how to divide these T plays, the capital T plays that we have between different actions so that we can make good decisions as we go across. So every time T, we have to make a decision about what arm IT to play. IT is what I'm calling the arm played at time T. Okay. So at, at every time little T, I have to make a decision about what, what arm to play. And the expected reward from that arm is going to be the mu of that arm. My goal will be to minimize my regret. So, it's, so in, in general, the natural goal would be to maximize the total expected reward, which is expected value of t equals 1 to t mu of i t. So this would be like your typical reward maximization problem, how to choose these arms to play so that your total expected reward over capital T is maximized. But in this literature, we often come like, uh, co uh, in, we often um, e evaluate the regret instead because it gives us more control over more quality of the solution, okay? So we think about instead of what my, my reward is, total expected reward is, I think about what my regret is. So what is regret? Regret means that if you knew which machine is the best, right? If you knew which, which machine has the most probability of winning the jackpot, you would have put all your money in that machine, right? Then you would have gotten the expected reward for that machine for all the time. So if you knew a priori all the distributions, these, all these unknown distributions, then your total reward will be t times, t times mu star, total expected reward would be t times mu star, where mu star is the maximum value. But because you didn't know, instead of mu star in every time step, you are getting something potentially lower, which is mu of the arm you play. So in every time step, your regret is the difference between what you could have gotten and what you actually got, the expected value of what you actually got. So every time step, when you don't play the best arm, which is the reward maximizer, you regret by this. And we will call this difference as delta i. So every time you don't play the best arm, you regret by delta i, and your total regret is the sum of all delta Our All our results will be about bounding this, this in, in. So a good algorithm will have a Okay, so 
So here is the summary of the rest of the uh, tutorial. So today I, I, I'll probably, def uh, so I am definitely aiming to cover this, which is two basic algorithmic techniques for solving this problem. So this basic problem, you have n arms, finite number of n arms, t round, capital T round, and all the arms have distributions, static, fixed distribution, unknown distribution, IID, rewards. You only observe the reward of the arm pulled and nothing else. So this is the basic classic setup. And I'll discuss two algorithmic techniques for bounding regret in, those, in that setup. And I'll, I'll discuss proof techniques as well. And then we will move on to generalization, which, are, which will actually make this setup useful for real power. And hopefully I can cover at least uh, two of, out of these three generalizations, and then we will move on to extending this to ring. Right, so getting back to this problem, any problems, any questions on the problem setup? Okay, so, so let's get back to the problem of exploration versus exploitation. Like what are we trying, what is the problem we are trying to resolve? And I hinted a little bit using the casino example, where I said that, or, or using the um, Amazon example, where I said that in order to learn about a arm, you need to play. So let's see a toy example of what can go wrong if you don't pay attention to it. If you use your usual machine learning technique, to learn instead of actually paying attention to exploration. So in this simple example of, I'll, I'll look at this setting, but with only n equals two. So two arms, so there are two arms, and then just for, uh, just for ease of notation, I'll, I'll call one arm as a black arm, other is the red arm. So the black arm has the mean reward of 1.1, so this is the machine that's better, and the red arm has a mean reward of one. And of course, the algorithm doesn't know. The algorithm doesn't know which arm is better than which. And so if the optimal thing to do, if you knew this, would be always to play the black arm for all time step. And then your expected total reward would be 1.1. Now your regret would be 0.1 every time you play red instead. And your goal is to how to play these arms so that you have low regret. So now then think about what you would do if you didn't consider exploration. So a typical thing to do in a, in a, for a data-driven decision making is whenever you have to make a decision, look at all the data you have and choose the best possible decision in terms of best possible prediction of your, of your uh, outcome. So if you do that, uh, what can go wrong? So imagine like in a few trials, however you made some in the initial decisions, uh, let's say so far black and red arm have been played a few times, three or four times, okay, so at this point. And for simplicity, let me assume also that red arm actually has no variance. So let's say red arm is actually, always produces reward one, there's nothing to learn about it, whereas black arm is actually varying a lot. It has mean 1.1, but it does vary above and below one. So let's say in the few initial trials, these are the outcomes. So red arm has no variance. It is always produced one so far. And the, the black arm has some variance in the three trials. With some constant probability, it produced samples so that the empirical mean went below 1.1. 1, 1. Not even below 1.1, 1. 1, it actually went below. And that can happen with a very good probability if you have only a few samples. Okay? So what, what happens at this point, let's say at this point here, is that you do your data-driven decision making, you compute the empirical mean of each arm. The empirical mean of this arm is correct, it's one, so you'll get the correct estimate. The empirical mean of this arm is right now below the actual mean, in fact, it's below one. And there's nothing wrong with that in machine learning, in data-driven decision making, we make mistakes. So by mistake, you think this arm is actually worse than this arm and you choose to play this. Okay, so you made one wrong decision, no problem. So what happens now is that because you decide to play red arm now by mistake, you'll get another sample of the red arm. Red arm sample is useless. You already know its mean is one. So you'll get another estimate, you'll improve the estimate of the red arm again to one. 
Next time you have again the same situation, your empirical mean estimate of black arm didn't change, your red arm, you already had a good empirical mean estimate, again you make the wrong decision of playing the red arm. And this will basically continue forever. Why? Because of bandit feedback. Every time you make a wrong decision, not only you suffer in terms of reward, you suffer in terms of learning. You don't learn anything new. So you have no way to correct your mistake if you, if you, keep, if you don't pay attention to exploration. You'll keep playing red arm. So how do you correct your mistake? Because, because you have to pay attention to exploration, you have to pay attention to not just who has the good empirical estimate, but also who has the more error? Which arm is likely to be, have an error in your So you need to give a benefit of doubt to an arm which is likely to have error in, more error in their estimate and play that um, instead, to explore that. So what, this is what we call exploration, exploitation trade-off. At a high level, you can think about exploitation as what you would do if you didn't have this sequential bandit interaction, you would simply think about playing the empirical mean reward maximizer based on the data so okay, or, or it could be a maximum likelihood decision based on it. So this is the typical thing you would do in a data-driven decision-making problem. But because you have this interactive bandit feedback problem, you should do some exploration to fix mistakes. And that means that play, even if they have worse empirical mean reward, empirical mean right now, you might want to play an action because it has not been played enough so far. So it doesn't have enough samples and therefore it might have more mistakes than the other. So you correct that mistake you need to. And all the algorithms I will discuss will somehow make sure that you balance between these two well. So you cannot do any of these too much. If you do too much exploitation, you will make mistake like this, Well, you never converge. If you do too much exploration, then you are basically ignoring all the information you have collected and you will just unnecessarily play bad art. Okay? So you have to balance these two goals in a, uh, in a smart. Yeah. Yeah, so the algorithm will adapt to the number of trials that you have. So the algorithm should make sure that it, it, it divides, let's say you, you, if you walk, walk in with $100, the way you would do exploration will automatically be different than if you walk in with 1000 Any other questions? So before I move on to give you algorithms with good upper bounds, I always like to think about, okay, what is the limitation? Like how much are you, how much your hands are tied? What's the best you can hope for? And uh, so, so let's think about what is the best I can hope for in this problem for, from the best algorithm out. So recall that we are trying to minimize regret, which is the total, uh, the total difference between, sorry, this should be T, yeah, which is the total regret at every time step. Every time step you play a suboptimal arm IT instead of the optimal arm, you suffer a regret, which is this delta IT. And the total regret is the sum of all the regrets in all time steps. The other way, to, very useful way to express it is, is in terms of the regret due to every suboptimal arm. So for every i that is not i star, there is a regret delta i every time you play. So delta i here is the difference between mu star and mu i. So this is zero if i is optimal, and otherwise there is a regret of playing. So every time you put money on the wrong machine, there is a fixed, fixed expected regret. So what will be your total expected regret? It will be delta i, sum over i delta i, times expected number of times you play arm i by your algorithm. So whatever your algorithm is, however expected number of times, total times, you play a suboptimal arm, that will affect the rig total rig. So if you want to think about what's the best you can do, you have to think about how many times you have to play a suboptimal. So why do, you, why do I say you have to play any number of times? So one could ask, 
why can't I just play up? Why can't there be an algorithm that just always play up? So information theoretically, that's not possible, right? So if you want a consistent algorithm in the sense that an algorithm that can learn any instance, then information theoretically, there is no way for the algorithm to know which is the best arm in the beginning. So there has to be a few number of mistakes that you must make, right? So if I can never say that any arm, let's say arm number five, I, this algorithm will never play arm number five because it's suboptimal. Because the algorithm has no way of knowing arm number five is suboptimal until it plays it because of bandwidth. So there has to be a minimum number of samples that it needs from every single arm, irrespective of how bad it is, in order to learn how bad. So in fact, uh, a very strong lower bound is been, uh, was given by Lyon Robbins in their 1985 work, which shows that for any given instance of MAV problem, so this is not a lower bound, like a worst case lower bound saying there exists some instance out there which is really bad for any algorithm. It's more like saying every instance of the problem, there is some mistake that any algorithm, any good algorithm must Okay, So I'll define what, what a reasonable algorithm means. But overall, the result says that for any given instance of the MAB problem, any algorithm will play a suboptimal arm. There's actually an exact expression if you assume that something about likelihood, but it's roughly this many plays. So it's roughly this many plays of suboptimal arm i and delta i. So delta i depends on the instance. So more suboptimal the arm is, actually the less you have to play. Okay? Because it seems counterintuitive, but actually arms that are really bad are really good for our algorithm. Because if there is a machine that just never gives you a jackpot, then you will figure that out in a few trials. You'll figure that out and eliminate that machine. A smart algorithm can figure that out in just a few samples and eliminate that from the context. The difficult ones are those that are just in close enough to the optimal, because then to distinguish between that and actual optimal, you have to get a lot of So in order to find out which arm is the best arm, the closer they are to optimal, it actually makes it harder for the algorithm to distinguish them to the optimal, right? But that doesn't mean like that close to optimal arms are bad, they have small regret. So overall, they still have benefit in terms of the regret, but the number of mistakes is actually inversely proportional to how good. So, so this is a lower bound, and we cannot hope to do better than this. Uh, the, the exact denominator is in terms of KL divergence, and it, it is when the arms have a ordinary distribution. So this is what our algorithms will also target. We will target this kind of bound. So the, the bound we will target would be sum over i not equals to i star log t over delta i with some. And there is also a worst case bound. So this is a this is a um, for any given instance. Yeah, I didn't mention reasonable algorithm means. I mean, in some sense, you cannot say any algorithm will make at least this much instance mistakes on every instance. Because let's say my algorithm is this stupid algorithm that always plays arm one. Okay, irrespective of what instance you give me, I just play arm one, arm number one. Whatever you call arm number one, I'll play that. Now, this algorithm is really bad for most instances where arm one is not optimal. But for instances where arm one is optimal, this is an optimal algorithm. It will make no mistake. right? So, so you cannot say every algorithm for every instance will play it. So you have to put some condition on to eliminate such trivially good algorithms for certain instances. So the condition they have is that the algorithm should be such that it can learn every instance, like it convert, the regret goes to, uh, regret over t, average regret goes to zero in infinite time. Okay, so it should converge for every instance. For example, the algorithm that plays arm one all the time, for most instances, it will never find the best. So that's not allowed. So they, they have a definition of only permissible algorithms, and then they can show that the minimum number of mistakes. There's also a worst case bound, and this is also something that both the algorithms I'll discuss will achieve. Uh, the worst case bound basically says that there exists some instance out there for which 
the regret is at least square root nd. So, so the difference between this kind of bound and the worst case bound is here the regret depends on these parameters delta r, right? So the, it depends on, uh, on this, this something that algorithm doesn't know, but it exists. In the real instance, there are different arms and they have different mu1, mu2, mu3. And here I'm just assuming mu1 is greater than mu2 is greater than mu n. And these are the delta i's. And these, the, the, once you are given an instance, the algorithm will do better or worse on each instance depending on, uh, depending on how bad these delta i's are. Yeah, delta, sorry, delta. So if these deltas are very small, you can see that the regret is large. And if these deltas are very large, then the regret is small. Now, the, the issue with this is that it kind of assumes that delta i is, it doesn't change with time. If it changes with time, then, then, it's, then, then this is not, a, this is not a, a admissible regret bound. What this shows is that in the worst case, what is the worst possible instance in terms of delta i? So how, what is the worst possible instance of delta i? It's not zero. Because if delta i's are zero, actually the grid is zero. So if you look at this regret bound, you'll feel that the worst possible delta i is, is zero. But actually the worst possible delta i's are something which is not too large and not too small. In particular, it is the case when delta i is roughly n over t, is when you, you have the worst possible setting because you cannot, if you ignore what the, if you ignore the optimal versus suboptimal arm, the total regret will be square root nt. But these are also small enough delta i so that you spend that much time in figuring out which is that. So this is the balance in which the, due to which the worst case regret is order square root. So this is just an uh, overview of, of uh, what we can expect from this problem. So overall, the, both the algorithms I'll discuss will try to achieve instance-dependent bound, like in terms of delta i of logarithmic instance-dependent bound, and worst-case bound of order square root. Any questions before I move on? Yeah. Yes, I will discuss the algorithm. So the first algorithm I'm going to discuss is the UCB algorithm. And this is one of the most popular techniques in multi-arm bandits. It's used, it will be used in this one. I, and we'll study the technique for, technique for the basic multi-arm bandit problem. But then we'll say that, see that it's easy to extend them to a lot of generalizations of this problem, including green. So this algorithm was introduced by Peter Auber in 2002. The idea is uh, to think about comparing arms based on two components, okay? So we discussed before that if you were doing exploitation only, which means you were just using your past data to make a decision, then a natural thing to do would be to look at the empirical mean based on the data so So exploit only strategy, would be to at every time little t, you look at all the samples you have. So this complicated looking expression is just saying sum of rewards over all time steps where arm i was. So this is just samples from arm i so far. So this is the nit is the number of times arm i was played so far. So this is simply the empirical mean for arm i from the data so far. So this is the empirical mean, and if you were doing exploit-only strategy, you would play, exploit-only strategy would play arg max over i, mu hat i. Okay. So this would be your exploit-only strategy. But as we discussed before in that example, in the toy example, this strategy would le lead you to not finding the optimal arm forever. Like, so it will give you a linear risk. So this, this is not a good strategy for our case. What they suggest for UCB algorithm is modify this strategy to decide not based on arg max mu hat it, but arg max of UCB. What is UCB? It's an upper confidence bound on the estimated mean. 
So the estimated mean is mu hat i t, but this estimated mean is can be away from the true mean by this amount. So how do we get the 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 uh, expression in the green box? Basically, depending on your setting, you can apply a concentration bound. Think about central limit theorem, but more specifically, um, turn off bounds or Azuma Hopkins bounds. So some a similar con uh, concentration bound if you apply you you would know we would see that mu hat i t minus mu i the true mean versus the estimated empirical mean is smaller than four log one over delta over n i t n i t is the number of samples so it's smaller than that with probability one minus delta so using this we can say that if I added this error to my empirical mean, then my then this is this gives me an upper bound on the actual because the the empirical mean is within this range of the true mean. So if I added this error to my empirical mean, I get an upper bound. So I'll always have this quantity UCBIT is more than my true mean with high prop for every single. So now the algorithm suggests that uh, what we call optimistic estimates, the UCB is an optimistic estimate, meaning it's overestimating the true mean always with high prop. It might be a very bad estimate, like if the, few, if the number of samples is very small, you are basically biasing your estimate by a lot. So it might be a very bad estimate, but it's always above the true mean. So over, always an overestimate of the true mean with high prop. So the UCB algorithm says that simply play, uh, choose an arm to play, not based on the empirical estimate, but based on the UCB, the upper confidence bound from the empirical, the overestimate. And why does it work? I mean, we, we, we would want to know, right? So why does it work to, uh, to do this instead of doing argmax of mu hat? So let me first explain you intuitively, and then we'll see a proof. Okay, so intuitively what is happening is we wanted to balance between exploitation and exploitation, right? So this would give us exploitation. This, just using this would mean that we are making decision based on the best empirical estimate. And if we go back to our counterexample, that means that we didn't pay attention to how many samples we have. Okay? So if we have a few samples of an arm, then the error as given by this expression is going to be very large for that. Now adding this term to our a comparator the, to our estimate means that the lower number of samples we have and the higher error we have, we are actually boosting the estimate of that. So we, we are giving some benefit of doubt to that arm. We are overestimating the mean of that arm if it has more error, which means that whenever we make decisions, we are not, we are not necessarily just choosing the arm with a higher empirical estimate. We might instead be choosing the arm with a higher error. And adding them up is somehow balancing the two goals. Okay? We have to still see if it's balancing it in the right way. Or... So this gives priority to the arms with lower number of samples and more error. And this gives priority to those with better. So these are to summarize the algorithm. Uh, usually the, you do a little bit of initialization in the beginning. There are different ways that people do initialization. Uh, basically the idea is you don't want this to be zero. So you might just play every arm once or you might just initialize an IT to be one so that it's one plus the number of, number of plays. So here I'm just saying play every arm once in the beginning and then compute the UCB for every arm empirical estimate plus that boosting term and then play the arm based on the highest value of P. Okay, so that's basically the whole algorithm. After you observe, after you play an arm, you observe the reward and you will update your UC. Because every time you observe a sample, empirical mean gets updated and the number of plays get. So if you have any doubt in the algorithm, let me know because once we start doing proofs, it will be good to be clear about it. Okay, so now we want to kind of 
make our intuition concrete, right? So we said intuitively we understand why it's a good idea to balance between exploration and exploitation. Let's see how UCB is able to do that to get sublinear regret or logarithmic regret. Right? So we saw that in that example, if you don't balance, you will get linear regret, you will never be able to figure out the optimal bound. So how can how does how is UCB able to do that? So let's bound the regret. So recall the regret was defined to be the total. Uh, yes. So total regret over all time steps. Every time you play a suboptimal arm, you suffer a regret. Or it can be expressed as over all arm i, the regret you would suffer if you play that arm times the number of times you play it. So essentially, in order to bound my regret by something like log t over delta i, I am looking to bound the expected number of plays of a suboptimal arm by log t over delta i squared. I'm ignoring constants, but something like that. So to bound regret, I'll just focus on bounding the plays of a suboptimal arm i by log t over delta i. And I, of course, I, uh, the algorithm doesn't know delta i squared. We'll show that by doing the UCB algorithm, it will automatically bound the number of plays, the number of mistakes by this. So let's think about uh, one particular arm i. So let's fix one arm i and, and think about what all do we know about. Okay, so, so you don't need to read the whole slide at once. We'll just go step by step. So remember, we are trying to bound the number of times an arm i will be played. So, so assume arm i is a strictly suboptimal arm. So we are assuming mu i is strictly less than mu star. So, and delta is basically the difference between mu star. So, arm i is a strictly suboptimal arm. We don't want to play it unless necessary. We want to bound the number of times arm i will be in our UCBL. So where, why would arm i will ever be played? The only reason arm i would be played if its UCB estimate at any given time happens to be more than the UCB estimate of the optimal arm because we only have UCB estimates to compare. So what we'll argue is that once the suboptimal harm has this many plays, this number, log t over delta square numbers, then, we, then the algorithm will no longer make this mistake. The UCB estimates will high, with high probability will never have the wrong. So why is, is it okay to bound, bound in this way? So, so first of all, before the algorithm has played a suboptimal arm this many times, the regret is already bound. Right? So think about the entire play of the algorithm. Before this many plays of arm i, the regret is smaller than 16 log t over delta due to arm i. The regret due to arm i before this many plays is bounded by this. Because if, I, if I'm not playing arm i enough times, then there's no regret. So before this many plays, we already have regret. All I want to show now is that there won't be any more plays after this. So how can I say there won't be any more plays of arm i? So what happens after these many plays? So after these many plays of arm i, I have these many samples for arm. So after I have these many samples, So once I have nit as 16 log t over delta i squared, it, it means I have these many samples, which means every, every concentration, uh, like a usual concentration bound like Chernoff bounds will tell me that mu hat it, the empirical estimate for arm i versus the true estimate is smaller than four log t over delta i squared with probability one minus one over two. So with very high probability, don't worry about this exact thing, but what I want to say is that for all time, little t's, this will be even by taking union. So with very high probability, this is coming from something like a Zuma half. No, sorry, not. 
So if you have NIT samples with probability this much, your empirical versus true estimate will have this. Now just substitute NIT from here. Once you have these many plays of arm i, you have these many samples. You have large number of samples. Then if I substitute that here, I get that this is smaller than delta i over t. Okay. So once I substitute nit greater than this, I get the gap is smaller than this. So my empirical estimate versus true estimate are within delta i by t. Again, I can also say a similar thing about UCB versus the empirical. So remember my definition of UCB estimate was to take the empirical estimate and add that term to it, okay? So by definition, this was defined as, as and again, I substitute once NITs, once I have enough samples of arm i, oh yes. So then if I substitute again Ni as this, I will get that this is smaller than delta. So what does that mean? What, is, what do these two results mean? It means that my UCB versus the true mu i, it's overall, the difference between that is less than delta. So the conclusion is UCB i t minus mu i is less than delta. So delta i is actually the gap between mu star and mu i. Okay? So pictorially, what is happening is this is mu star, let's say, and this is mu i. I assume mu star is more than, strictly more than mu i. So there's a gap delta between them, call it delta i. Okay? And what I just showed you is that whatever these two estimates are, they are not too far from mu i in the sense that they cannot exceed, go beyond mu. So mu, mu, the difference between this and this is less than delta i, which means that this doesn't go above mu. And why is that useful? Remember, to make a decision, I'm comparing UCBI to UCBI star t. And I don't know how good UCBI star t is. I don't have any bound on the number of sample I have seen for the octopus. I only said, I have you seen enough sample for the i thumb, not for i star. This could be a really bad, bad estimate in the sense that mu hat, of, mu hat of i star could be really far away from mu star. But what I know is that irrespective of where I am, all the UCB estimates are above their true value. So wherever UCB i star is, it's above mu star. That I know, could be anywhere above. So by that, I know that UCB i star is here, and I already showed you that UCB i t is below mu star, so which means that when I compare UCB i star to UCB i t, the order will always be. So UCB i star being here will always be above UCB i. So this means that once I have this many samples of arm i, I will never make, made a, make a mistake of thinking that ith arm is better than the, than the optimal arm irrespective of how good an estimate of optimal arm I have. So optimal arm's estimate could be completely wrong, but its UCB would be always above this true mean, so I will always conclude optimal arm. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So the only thing I'm using about UCB I star is the is this uh, the construction that we made that for every single arm, the UCB is an upper confidence bound on its mean. So it could be very bad estimate, but it's always above the true mean. So. It could be a very good estimate also. So UCB I star could be a very good or a very bad estimate of mu star, but it's always above mu star. I'm not saying it's above mu i, right? So it's above mu star. So that's first observation. Second observation, which we did the calculation here, is that 
UCBIT is within delta of mu i. Okay, so here we use that we have enough samples so that UCBIT is within delta of mu i. So, so, that, so if it's be above delta, it cannot exceed mu star. So it remains below mu star and mu, UCBI star is above mu star. So that's why the order is. Yes. Yeah, so, so the whole point of the algorithm is to be optimistic so that you are overestimating the optimal arm always. So optimal arm gets like this, even if it doesn't have enough samples, as long as the suboptimal arm has enough samples, it will, it will be played. High probability, yeah. So basically, yeah, something that I fudged over is we aim for this kind of probability. Uh, so that even if we take union bound over all little t's, we still get a probability of 1 minus 1 over t for all time steps. And then the total regret is just a constant. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So, yeah, another thing I fudged over when I use this when I use this uh, Chernoff or uh, Azuma Hopding bound, is I assumed a constant, um, constant upper bound on the rewards. So, so think about like rewards between zero and one, or or some constant uh, range of rewards. So, so you can then apply, then you don't need to worry about what variances, because Chernoff bounds can be applied to any IID very samples with constant. Uh, Yeah, so you can also extend that to sub-Gaussian uh, uh, distributions, like if you have infinite support, but it's sub-Gaussian with some constant uh, standard deviation, then it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've, I've not like finished this last part here. Yeah, so, oh, you mean it should be log n? Yes, yeah, we are implicitly. So, so once you have this, so, so, so far we have shown that once you have enough plays of a suboptimal arm, you will not choose it anymore. Uh, you will not, uh, with high probability, you will not play it. And before you have enough plays, your regret is anyway bounded by, uh, your number of mistakes is anyway bounded by this, so that the regret is bounded by 16 log t over delta i, is sum over i. So your total regret, the so total number of mistakes in terms of arm i, the number of times you will play by mistake arm i is bounded by that because after that many plays, you don't play it anymore. And therefore, the regret is delta i times that for arm i, sum over i will give you. So this gives you very, very close to uh, the lower bound of Lyra. Not exactly because the lower bound applies to specific uh, distribution of rewards like the Bernoulli distribution. So instead of delta i, you have a KL divergence term which is tighter, but it's very close for, for many distributions. 